about the time you think you know everything, the time you realize you don't know as much as you thought you did. Yeah, there's no way in the world that you would say on this farm we're doing it everything like our granddad did. Change is the only constant. Our life just constitutes a little more change. It's such a different, unique kind of job that you know, it is fun that you can do something different year to year. Farming is a living, breathing, moving creature all the time. Every time you talk to people, they think, oh, you from Idaho, when they hear that I grow potatoes. We're the second largest producer of fresh potatoes in the United States here in the San Luis Valley. The soil here is really good for farming. So we grow mainly potatoes because they really like our sand. They are kind of like little islands of lushness amongst the desert. We get less than seven inches of precipitation a year. I read these articles about people saying, oh yeah, we just, we kind of get by on 18 inches of rain. I'm like, holy moly, 18 inches of rain. You know what we couldn't do with 18 inches of rain in 30 days more growing season because we raise things here in basically a 90 day growing season. The San Luis Valley is a place of climate extremes. On high, deep snowpack feeds rivers and streams, tracing their way down to over 1,500 farms and ranches on the valley floor. Yearly water supply depends on the spring runoff. Peak flows in May and June dry up by July and August. Growers turn to groundwater in the late summer months to continue watering their crops. For decades, surface water flows were reliable and groundwater was a seemingly endless supply. This is where I grew up. This is my family farm. My uh, granddad bought this place by paying up the back taxes in 1938, and we've been here ever since. So I'm the fourth generation. I left to go to college and knowing that I wanted to come back and farm. And so I left the valley on purpose. It's like, I need to go see something else. And two days after classes ended, I was back here ready to just farm. What we grow here on our farm is potatoes. We have some ground that we put into forage for our cattle and then crops that we use for cover crops and soil health which just means we plow them in as green manure. I grew up on the farm doing farm work, tractor work as a kid. We grow a little bit of quinoa, we do a little bit of grazing mix, we do a little bit of hay forage, but potatoes is really where we shine and we pour a lot of our interest into. I'm Jeff's father. Jeff is in the process of taking over the business. My grandfather started here in the valley in the 30s, and then I started myself in about 1975. We purchased a potato packing facility that has been very helpful in being able to carry the farm for the next step. From there, it grew to 26 quarters, which is a little over 3,000 farmable acres. I'm a fifth generation rancher in the San Luis Valley. As a kid, I remember a lot of lambing, a lot of milking cows. Went to school at Colorado State University, graduated, was in the banking industry for a while, doing ag financing. It was then and there that I was doing all that traveling and seeing a lot of farmers and meeting a lot of farm people that I decided I wanted to get back to the valley, how unique and how special it was. Our farmers, Esperanza Farms, LLC, it's myself, my wife, we've got some partners in it, and we've got 14 circles, six in potatoes, five in barley, and three in alfalfa. Then aside from Esperanza Farms, my partners as well as myself, we have a cattle operation. Myself and Sherry, we run approximately 100 head of cattle. Just realizing our resources here as far as water, land, it, it just gave me a greater appreciation for wanting to come back. Farms have gotten larger over time, making it easier to invest in labor-saving machinery and technology. We rely on larger farms to grow food efficiently and affordably. Family farms continue to play an important role in the valley, as it takes all sizes and production methods to feed a growing population. As a kid, that's all we did was flood irrigated. There weren't any pivots back then. So you made sure you had lots of water. That's how you got stuff done. You learned how to control it. When I found out about these pivots and how easy they are, I mean, they are work. You still got maintenance on them, but they've changed the whole scene. Efficiency of agriculture. 
The farm originally was 160 acres. My mom and dad bought the farm, had a small dairy here for quite a while, and they raised just alfalfa for feed for the cattle. There was no wells at that point in time. Everything was dependent upon surface water or water that we get from our ditch canal that comes from the Rio Grande. Dad and his mom and now dad and my mom have grown it to about 1,300 irrigated acres. If you just take a small look at just the little area right around our farm, you know, how many farmers there are, none of us do anything the same. You know, everything's a little different. We have larger corporations in the area that, you know, they are a little bigger, but they're still run by local people. The larger that we got, the more efficient that we got because we could use a lot of the same equipment over larger acreage. The efficiencies were very helpful, but it came only because of being able to find good people to help me. We have six full-time farm employees now and started out with one. Water use in the Rio Grande Basin outstripped water supply long ago. Farms continue to grow in size and efficiency, while few question the unintended consequences of irrigation technology. Over-reliance on the aquifer led to lower flows on rivers and creeks, impacting surface water irrigation. For the valleys, farms, and ranches, towns, and economies to survive, the habits from wetter times are changing drastically. When the drought hit pretty severely in 2002, we came to the realization that we don't have an endless supply of water and that things were going to have to change. We've had to make a lot of adaptions to what we grow and, and how we grow it and where we're going to use our natural resources the most wisely. I think the water usage, I would say, comes to our mind on almost every decision first. But every drop of water that we put on, we log it. Every time the sprinkler goes on and does anything, we write it down. And then at the end of the year, we evaluate. How many potatoes did we get for every drop of water that went on? And we're very conscious of what we're doing and trying to make sure that it's worth it. We have crops that we probably might not grow in the future because the cost of the water that goes into them is too high for the return. And for us, moral line says that we can't spend that water if we're not gonna get the return. It's kind of a hard decision to make because it's stuff that we've grown for a long time and is a big part of the farm and the farm's history. But looking forward, there's some tough decisions that have to be made. We got to maximize our surface water out of the Rio Grande as much as we can. You got to conserve this surface water and even the, the well water. Taking some end guns off some pivots, you're not getting the productivity sometimes with what that end gun's servicing. We've moved to high efficiency nozzles, better at getting the water to the ground without losing water to evaporation or wind. We also recharge all of our surface water that comes onto our farm through recharge pits and reservoirs. So anything that's coming down the ditches is going straight into the aquifer to later pump or to help build our aquifer level back up to a sustainable level. The crops that we plant in the off season help with soil health and building organic matter. Those crops are using much less water and as a result, our farm as a whole, we're putting in more water in recharge than we're using to pump out. We put a lot of emphasis on building up the water holding capacity and the amount of carbon we can put in the soil because you can have just dirt that's just sand that'll run through your fingers or you can have what we've been building towards and you have soil that has organic matter and bugs and worms and creating those colonies of happy bugs have helped limit a little bit of the water that we put on and the fertilizer and nutrient requirements too, because if the soil's healthy and happy, it's producing some of that itself. Part of what we've done relative to the soil health is paying dividends in the fact that our quality is much better, I believe, and our yields are much more consistent, and that helps because, you know, you have to have a crop to sell to pay things off. Also having the soil health allowed us to bring cows in on the farm, which is sort of a cyclical. The cows in turn help the soil in their own way and it helps the farm because instead of the potatoes having to pay for all of the soil health practices that we do, now the cows can help offset some of that cost while giving back. 
We're able to do a lot of experimentation on different types of products, biological food sources for plants, different ways of applying things. We can really do very good science behind our experiments that are very quantifiable by being a bigger farm. You're always, what if? And what if we changed this or what if we tried this practice? But the, the fact of the matter is, is come next spring, maybe it rains more than you're used to. Maybe it blows a little bit more. Maybe it's this or it's that or it's drier. You can't really say that we go out and we flip switch one through six on, on the 1st of March and everything's the same. No, everything's different. So you adapt and you change and you go with what it is. We have always wanted to try and figure out a way how we can become more self-sustaining. We put in a solar system. We've looked at the cost of electricity and what it's done since 2003 and just paying attention to your expenses. Consumers more and more are wanting to know, are you sustainable? Are you using best management practices? Are you using pesticides? Are you using fertilizers? Are you not contaminating groundwater? So we try and be real diligent in implementing as many best management practices as we can. We probably use less inputs today to raise more than we did 30 or 40 years ago. And that carbon footprint is less than it used to be because we're more efficient. I think there is that myth that we just do it because we can. And you can use all the water you want because you can. You can use all the fertilizer you want because you can. It is a tool, but I don't know anybody that they just put it on no matter what. Everybody's bottom line is their bottom line. It's no different than someone running a home or household urban dweller, you have to live within your means of sorts. There's a greater need for food than ever before. Over the last century, the global population has quadrupled. Colorado's population has grown by more than 1.7 million people since the early 2000s. If the next 30 years are similar, the state's population is projected to nearly double. Food demand will continue to increase, shaping agricultural markets in ways we haven't seen before. Climate change and rapid urbanization also create major changes for water security and land use. As time goes on, the average American is farther and farther away from ag. I think we're less than 1% now is involved in ag. Anybody wanting to get started on farming, it is extremely, extremely tough. It requires so much capital and there's times that the margins are so tight. If you don't manage your risk each and every day, it, it, it can eat you up in a hurry. And just watching it day in and day in and out, watching your supply, the quality, where you can be able to take care of your customers. You gotta have a very, very good understanding of how productive your farm could be. And I think if we're not careful on how we take care of our water, we can be hurting ourselves. I wanna see ag in the valley continue and I want to see ag and our farm continue and so I hope that we can balance out our community's use of water resources. The valley is pretty good about working together and dealing with kind of outside issues on our water. I really hope that we can balance that out and be able to deal with the internal that we're causing a problem and that we've got to fix it and we're on that road. A big part of what our community is doing is we're learning to live within our means. We're learning to pump less water in a way that is sustainable for that next generation. The main driver of the economy here in the San Luis Valley is agriculture. And if the agriculture goes away, then a lot of the economy here will go away as well. I would really love to see my kids be able to take over the farm and be able to enjoy the lifestyle that Lynn has had and that I've had. The human element of the farm is really important. You know, they have technology that can sit out in the field and tell you how dry the soil is, but until you go out there and you get your hands in the dirt and you really evaluate what are the plants doing, what do they need, there's something lost there if you're not out in it. We try our best to make sure that food that we're providing is healthy for everybody and have no problems feeding my children the crops that I grow because I know that they're healthy and they were grown in the right way. 
We hope that there's a place for agriculture to stay vibrant and be, and be viable in this country, to do what it's always done, and that's feed the populace. For agriculture to be sustainable in the San Luis Valley, there will continue to be constant adaptation for new realities. This is home for generational farming families and surrounding communities who enjoy a quality of life maintained by the backbone of agriculture. Growers are doing what they can so that the next generation of Coloradans in the valley and across the state I found a potato. have that backbone to rely on.